Oh, hello there. So I lost my pen. Oh, there it is. I was looking for it. Uh, and today we're going to talk about Forex, but it's a little bit of an extension on what we learned the first time. Um, there's, there's no more graphs or anything like that, but it's actually just giving you a little bit more depth to the information that we're learning about foreign exchange. So the first part is, is exchange rate systems. And there's really kind of two different types of, of exchange rate systems that countries can have. They can have what are called fixed rate systems, and they can have what are called floating rate systems. Now, your textbook will go into a lot more detail than is probably necessary. And there's ones where they're like, oh, it's a hybrid float. And I'm like, oh my gosh, just call it either a float or a fixed. Um, basically, the difference is this. In a fixed system, the government of a country or its central bank says we want our currency to be linked to another currency for basically a fixed amount. You would say like, no matter what, there are always going to be, the exchange rate will always be five euros to one US dollar, right? And so no matter what happens, we're going to do what we do, whatever it takes to make sure that the rate stays the same. Um, before the 1970s, Basically, all of, of Western Europe and the United States and Canada and, and all these others, they were all in a fixed rate system, actually, that were all linked to the United States dollar um, before 1973. And, and all of them agreed with all of the kind of Western powers that they would link their currencies to the U.S. dollar and that the U.S. dollar would have a fixed rate conversion to gold. And it would have like a certain amount of dollars to gold. So in other words, all of the currencies of like Italy and France and, and the United Kingdom and Germany, West Germany, at least at the time, um, they all had kind of gold based currencies, but they were all only backed by US gold because all of them agreed they would fix theirs with the US and it facilitated transactions. Um, it, it, in the central banks, though, have to intervene in order to ensure the value stays within its narrow range. The goal, usually there's, there's kind of this specific goal, is to facilitate trade. Um, in particular, the goal can be if it's one country doing it, as opposed to like a whole bunch of them, like what we had um, in what was called the Bretton Woods system. Um, if it's just one country, the goal is to keep its currency cheap so that its, its exports from that country can also be cheap. So if you're a, if you're a export oriented economy, if you're Nigeria, where you export lots of oil, or you're China, where you export lots of, of goods and, and, and basic goods, right, manufactured goods, you want to keep your currency artificially cheap so that other countries come in and want to buy it. Um, and, and you also limit imports that way. So from the Nigerian perspective, if they keep their currency value very cheap, they'll sell lots of oil. And at the same time, it prevents Nigerians from buying stuff from overseas. So it helps develop the economy a little bit. Now, a floating rate system would be where the government's just like, whatever, we don't care. We're going to let supply and demand basically dictate the value of our currency. So it allows a free exchange of the currency and facilitates international transactions that way. Um, the benefit is that it actually kind of buffers an economy. Um, let me advance the slide here. It buffers an economy from global recessions. And so I'll give you an example, right? In, in 2008, it was a really nasty recession. And, and lots of European countries in the United States went into recession. And among those was Greece. Now, Greece entered a really nasty recession along with the rest of the developed world um, in 2008. Um, and, and they, though, use the euro, right? So their currency is not something that they get to control the value of. And the euro actually was, was doing quite well. And the, overall, the eurozone went into recession. Um, but the Greeks had a really bad version of the recession. But other countries in, in Europe had an, oh, OK. So the euro didn't really drop in value very much. Now, the, the problem was for Greeks, that made their goods and services more expensive, right? When in a normal setting, if their currency, if they had kept their own currency, then they, their currency value could have dropped. And if their currency value had floated and moved around a little bit more, um, then it would have insulated them from, the, from that recession in a little bit greater of a, of a fashion than it did. So there was a lot of talk about Greece leaving the Eurozone so that it could actually have a currency that was allowed to be much cheaper, which could facilitate them to recover from that recession. Unfortunately, it wasn't, though. They were tied to the Eurozone, where their currency, they, they didn't get to create their own. So that was kind of a downside. So an advantage of having a currency that can really float in value in terms of supply and demand is that it can allow you to recover more quickly from a global recession. Um, just by the way, just to make sure that I'm clear here, the euro does float. Um, so the euro floats against like the US dollar and a whole bunch of other currencies. So it's still supply and demand that changes its value. But my example with Greece is, is that within the broader eurozone, Greece doesn't have its own currency. 
And so it was kind of using basically the broader Eurozone currency. And so it couldn't really adjust given the economic conditions of Greece. Um, we could spend all day talking about that stuff. But so some historical and current examples, right? I mentioned that Europe and the US, Western Europe, right, maintained a fixed system. Um, in fact, from 1871 to 1914, most currencies in Europe were pegged or linked to the United Kingdom. Um, the pound was kind of the global currency of that era, and they had a huge amount of gold reserves um, up to World, World War I. After World War I, um, lots of the countries moved off the gold standard, and some of them went to floating systems, and some of them tried to do fixed, and it was very difficult. During World War II, the United States, um, through a, a meeting, had a meeting at Bretton Woods, which is in, um, I want to say it's in Maine, and there was this very famous economist um, who, who kind of was instrumental in, in getting us to recreate a fixed system where the U.S. would hold on to the gold and, um, and essentially all of these other European economies would fix their rates to the U.S. dollar. Um, and that very famous economist was John Maynard Keynes, actually. So, um, and so he orchestrated the recreation of a system that lasted about 30 years um, until the U.S. went off the gold standard, at which point all of the other kind of European countries said, well, if yours isn't really backed by gold, then then we shouldn't have our currencies linked to yours. Um, and so all of them now kind of float. So most countries in the world today actually use a soft peg, which means they have like a range that they let it go in between or a crawling peg where they go like, okay, we're gonna let it go between here and here. But you know, if we need to adjust the target, we can do that. That's the majority of countries. Um, China does that, Russia does it, Nigeria does it, Iran does it. Some of them are much more targeted than others. Um, you know, so Iran, for example, um, their currency is very, very, the real is very, very targeted. Um, the Nigerian currency is very targeted. The Russian currency moves around a little bit more. The Chinese currency moves around a little bit more. Most more developed countries, MDCs, like Japan, US, EU, the UK, Mexico, they use float. Um, so they, their currencies just go up and down in relation to each other. Now, so I'm going to show you a couple graphs to illustrate this. So this is the US dollar to the Nigerian Naira. Um, I, think the, I think I'm saying that right. I think could be, yeah, I think it's Naira. Um, I'll have to go back and double check. You can see that it doesn't move around very much, right? So for a very long time, from 2009 till 2015 or so, it was basically around 155 or so um, Naira to US dollars, or US dollars to, to Naira in this case. Um, and then, you know, you can see that, that, that it's kind of adjusted over the last few years. Compare that to the same time period, this is the British pound and the US dollar. And so, you know, US dollar to pound sterling, is all over the place, right? It's all over the place. So the difference is pretty profound. The Iranian currency, the real, is very fixed, um, you know, over this time period as well. So you can see they kind of just have a fixed rate. Um, whereas then you look at a country like Russia, for example, the ruble, they have a range, and then they allowed it to float a little bit more up here, um, and that that kind of changes some of the things. But they're they're still within a certain range that they allow it to be within. Um, now, how do they do that, right? Like that's the like, how do they do it? So how governments increase or decrease the value of their currency in the Forex market? There are three techniques. First, you can literally buy foreign currencies and supply more of your own. So you can go into the, if you're a country and you're like, I really want um, my currency to be cheaper, right? Because most of the time you want your currency to be cheaper so that you facilitate exports. You're going to buy the other country's currency and literally just say, here's Chinese yuan. We would like to buy US dollars. And then you take those dollars and you stick them in your back pocket and you don't do anything with them because you don't want them to get back out into the forex market because if you're china let's say you're china and you want the the chinese currency to be cheap that means you need the american currency to be expensive so you're going to buy 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 all the american dollars you can get your hands on and just hold on to them um, and they, they have to do that um, and they did for many years the chinese government maintained huge amounts of u.s dollars and they couldn't really do anything with them um, because if they put them back out there, then the U.S. dollar would go down in value and the Chinese yuan would go right back up and that would defeat the purpose. Another thing you can do is monetary policy. If you change your interest rates, you can change other people's demand for your financial assets. So, for example, you know, right now the Central Bank of the United States has really low interest rates, which means that our stocks, bonds and real estate especially our bonds that pay very low interest rates are not very attractive to people around the world. So it doesn't, it means that there's not very much demand for the dollar, which means the dollar is relatively cheaper. And there are some people who, who would say, and particularly, you know, other countries, not Americans, they would say that the Fed is artificially keeping the dollar cheaper 
by pushing interest rates down so low. I think that probably there's an argument for that at some points, but but right now in the middle of the COVID pandemic, it's unlikely that the Fed really cares about exchange rates right now that much. But certainly, you know, a country that wanted to make sure its currency was cheap would keep its interest rates low so that other countries don't want to come in and buy stocks, bonds, and real estate. Another example of how you could accomplish that, like in China, for example, in order for them to keep their currency cheap, they restrict the ability of foreigners to come in and buy Chinese stocks, bonds, and real estate. Because what they don't want is Americans to show up and say, oh, I want to buy a piece of this Chinese company. I want to buy some Chinese real estate. Because when they do that, then it bids up the price of Chinese currencies and makes Chinese exports more expensive. Of course, there's also the historical problem in, in China of foreign governments and foreigners coming in and interfering in China through doing things like buying Chinese stocks, bonds, and real estate. The third thing you can do is you can prevent citizens from buying and selling foreign currency. Um, and China does that as well. So above a certain amount of money, um, the Chinese government is very, very strict about not allowing basically um, Chinese people uh, to, to purchase too many things um, that are denominated in dollars. They really don't want basically Chinese people to take their yuan and put them into the foreign exchange market. Um, and, and or rather to, to essentially, um, they, they don't want I got to flip this around. They're perfectly fine with Chinese people buying American stuff uh, because that bids up the price of basically the American dollar. What they don't want is the other way around, right? So th there's kind of restrictions around foreign currency and things like that. Okay, now the last part of, of all of, of, of all of kind of learning econ here is what are called real exchange rates. And, and these are just adjusted for inflation. Right? So a lot of times we talk about an exchange rate and we would say, well, but the difference is, is that stuff costs more in, in other countries. And real exchange rates are just calculated as currency A, right? So it's literally like, you know, the, the ratio of the two currencies. So we could say like US dollars to euros times, right, times the price level in country A divided by the price level in country B. Now, if you're wondering like how in the what, like what does that do? Um, we, we'll run through an example, right? So let's say you have um, the US dollar, right? Um, and actually we'll, we'll kind of flip this around. Let's say euros to US dollars. Um, so there are three euro to one US dollar. That's the current ratio, right? Um, and so if you're an American and you go to Europe and you, you say, okay, I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna exchange, then they give you three euros, okay? We multiply that by the price level. So let's say the price level in Europe is 300, right? That's the index value. Um, and then the price levels in the US, USA, are, oh, let's say 900, right? And, and I could have actually, maybe it's easier if we just do like 100 is their CPI. And let's just keep this simple. Their CPI and our CPI is 100 and 300, right? So prices are in, in Europe are one third of what they would be in the United States. Okay, so you can kind of basically run across here and see like what's going to happen when we do that. Well, this is three times one third, and that's equal to one. So what this is actually telling us is that one euro is actually equal to one US dollar. And so the real rate, the real exchange rate is one to one. And that's because even though the one dollar buys three euros, the prices in the United States are three times as high. Um, and so the, if you take that into account, then the real rate is one to one. They're, they're basically the same value. This matters right, a lot. Um, and so here's an example of the Mexican peso to the US dollar over the last you know, 20 years or so. The real exchange rate basically stayed the same, even though the nominal exchange rate differed dramatically. So if you were to go and like pull up the data that I showed you in, the, in a previous you know, note, the, the earlier part, all of these are all nominal. And so they don't really take into account the real exchange rates. And so the, the values, right, for um, GBP to US dollar would be dramatically affected by something like that if prices are much higher and or inflation rates are much higher in another country.
Now, one interesting kind of connection to this, and, and it's not something that's really going to appear very much in the econ exam or something, it's called the Big Mac Index. And it's related to something called purchasing power parity, which is the idea that it's more expensive or cheaper in some countries than in others. And, and we can basically compare a market basket of goods in one country to another country and then compare their two exchange rates and see, like, is one country's currency overvalued compared to the other? And there's a very famous um, economics magazine called The Economist that publishes something called the Big Mac Index. Because the nice thing about a Big Mac, the cheeseburger, we're all coming full circle here, is that it's sold identically in more than 100 countries around the world. And so you can very quickly say, OK, if a, if a Big Mac costs X amount in um, Britain and it costs X amount in, in the United States, and then we convert those back into, say, US dollars, right? The US one you wouldn't have to convert. Then you can see, like, oh, how much more overvalued is a particular currency? So if you were to Google search the Big Mac index, you will be able to actually find um, a whole bunch of these comparisons using this. Um, and I just, I, I think it's fascinating. So you can spend a lot of time here playing around with it and go, okay, you know, the Chinese yuan is 39% undervalued against the dollar. Um, and you can see the franc is overvalued and the Lebanese pound is, so it's an interesting little way of kind of doing that. You can adjust them by GDP and do all kinds of things like that too. So, all right, hopefully this helps you understand a little bit more about exchange rate systems. See you next time.